Hi, welcome back to my video series. In a previous post, I'd indicated I no longer had my Altrix license, and that is still the case, but I couldn't stay away from doing videos. I thought I would do a set of videos talking about data structures, since data is at the heart of any Altrix workflow. And I'm going to do this in a couple of small sets. The first one of these being, let's talk about your source. Data coming into your workflows varies depending upon how you get your data, where you find your data, and what you need to do with your data. So the very first step in your Alteryx workflow is to identify what your data is. Typically, a business analyst immediately jumps into their workflow without really looking at what their data coming in says to them. And sometimes you get yourself into a bit of the deep end, as the saying goes, where you're not sure exactly where you're going or how you got there, what you're doing. So we want to talk a little bit today about what standard data formats are and how to actually begin your data journey as you find your source and understand your source and identify what it means. It's always good to know who owns the data that you're using to communicate with them or at least with a technical person that you have an interface to so they can answer your questions and give you some better insight into the data. A lot of times you don't have that opportunity and Alteryx has the ability to do some data mining, data analysis for you, but it's always a good place to start to see what information is available to you. So what we're going to talk about today is just what some of the source data structures are. We'll talk a little bit about what metadata is, what data models are, and we will talk briefly about push versus pool of your data. So let's get started. Typically the data that you'll be using will be stored in a database. The most common form of the database being used these days is a relational database. From a definition, Relational database has been around for quite a long time back in the 1970s, but it really wasn't in until the 80s that companies like Oracle really solidified the availability as well as the cost price point to get a lot of companies to begin implementing relational databases. All relational databases adhere to the general principles of relations and asset as the saying goes, which is data reliability, data consistency, as well as data organizations, and they all support the SQL query language, or SQL, which is a standard across all of the RDBMSs, as well as some of the non-SQL sources as well, support some version of SQL just because it's a common language. But at the end of the day, a relational database contains tables. Sometimes it has views of those tables, but more significantly, it has relationships between those tables. All RDBMSs are not created equal, but just simply having an RDBMS is a great place to go ahead and access your data. Taking a look at what we can talk about from a relational database, I still have access to my own data, which is stored in an access database. It is to a degree, a relational database, it typically does not support relationships, but it can if you want to do so. And what you will see when you look inside of any relational database is you'll see a list of tables. You can query and look at those tables. Most applications that access databases have the ability to do some data visualizations. Inside of Access, you can also create queries, which to a degree are the same as a view. So anytime you see a list of tables, a list of views or queries, you're probably in a relational database. Relational database can be co quite complex. 
not very good for reporting. So along the way, the data warehouse concept came along. And that is where you post-process the relational data out of your transactional or business application and put it into different data stores to make reporting easier. A typical data warehouse uses terms like fact tables, dimension tables, and may organize them in a star schema. Star schema just simply identifies the way the relationships within the tables exist, and that is essentially that you have a fact table which is your metrics, and it's surrounded by a bunch of relational dimensional tables. Typically, if you look inside of your relational database, and it is organized as a star, as a data warehouse, especially one in a dimensional model, you'll see a little bit different names, hopefully. You'll see things like dimensions and fact tables. And this is the little Daisy Hill data warehouse that I use. And you can see in this example, I have a breed table, a puppy, a puppy table, as well as a view that puts it all together. But again, a data warehouse is simply a specialized relational database. Since a lot of organizations don't really want to give you access to their relational databases, saying that you as a reporting person or a business analyst will simply slow down the application, you will typically get your data as well as data from external sources in a variety of flat files. In this case, when I talk about a flat file, we really want to talk about a plain text file, nothing that has a specific organization other than it's probably separated by delimiters. The delimiters change. There may be commas. Commas are a bit dangerous when you're separating data because a lot of times the data that you'll be using has commas built into the data itself. And so most technical people like to use bangs or pounds, which is the pound sign or the exclamation point to separate the fields out, it becomes a bit less likely to cause a conflict. And as an example of a delimited file, very quickly, bring it up in a text editor, you can see that the first record has the name of my columns that are in this flat file, and then it is separated by the straight up and down line. And we have the ID plus the name of the breed in here, so then we need to unpack this once we read it. Most flat files have a pretty simple construct to where you just have multiple fields that are strung out across one after the other. Don't forget PDF files. A lot of times companies do not even like to send you data. They say, oh, we have that data going out in our own internal report. Why don't you just pull the data off of our report that we already generate? And so what they do is they generate the report as a PDF, and they'll be more than happy to send you the PDF file. One of the nice things about a PDF file is that if it's coming out of a report, it is actually in a repeating fashion. It's pretty standard, and so it doesn't change from page to page or section to section. It's just that you have to determine how to pull headers and footers and details out of this data and to read it yourself manually because there's a lot of information that you won't use. Check one of my videos. We talk about how Alteryx can handle this, but it really comes down to you being able to translate through the format that's there. But again, development teams liking, like typically to be lazy. If they already have something that meets your needs, they'll send that to you rather than put things in a format that you find much more easier to digest. There are also some EDI standards out there, electronic data interchange. These are, again, potentially more archaic, but they've been around forever. And it's a good way that uh, in the banking industry and in the medical industry, there are a lot of standards that have been identified. And this allows them to continue to share data between different organizations within a basic construct. These are typically also 
considered flat files, but the formats can be much more sophisticated and much more complex, in whereby you have multiple record types within the same feed, as well as multiple fields at any section within there. But the nice thing about this format is that it has a good documentation out there because people share it. This is an example of an X12 record, which X12 is a lot of industry standards. People use utilize them across banking, medical, as well as manufacturing. And it's all a definition of the subclassifications of the records. In this case, it really looks difficult for you to see because it does not have a header. But the definition of this record format will tell you, lead you through how to read this. As you can see here is a repeating group. So this happens to be an invoice, company address, city and state. And then we have down here the repeating group for values. Again, this is just an example of one. And so you would have to figure out how to translate through this given the standard that you can get off of a shared platform. You've probably heard of XML, which is Extensible Markup Language. This again is designed to go ahead and give you a bit more flexibility of the data that's coming into it. XML itself is a very flexible structure and you need to know what parts of that language will be used to develop this feed that you get so that you can translate what it is that's going on. This is an example of an XML feed. It has some header information into it and then it begins to build a coded record. So for example this happens to be a sales XML feed. It has in it the year make and model of a plane as well as information about where and how to find it. As you can see, sometimes you will have conditional fields in here as well. So for example, here we happen to have an email address here, but we do not have an email address up here. So again, reading through this can be a bit difficult. It's good to understand what this language is doing, but also realize that there are plugins that can help you. And finally, there are a lot of data stores that are becoming what they call NoSQL or NonSQL. These are alternate structures that are designed to give you higher performance for larger data types and larger records. Some of the examples of NoSQL databases are CouchDB, MongoDB, Cassandra, and Apache Giraffe. I've used a few of these for development teams. They seem to like this methodology of using the data, some of the NoSQL database systems provide a lot of flexibility and control as well as portability and performance. And again, the beauty of NoSQL is that you can store any types of documents or any information or structure that you want within it. It's up to you to define what you're going to do. I found the most useful of all these structures is something called JSON. It is a document type. It is sort of a reduced set version of XML. This is one example of, a, of JSON, which has to do with keeping a list of books. So the JSON document is structured as such. And again, you need to get with the development team to understand how they store their data and how you need to read the data. And then you can process through it if you do not have JSON available to you. There are a number of readers and they typically will just give you a dump of data that looks a lot like this format out of the NoSQL database, especially the document databases such as CouchDB and MongoDB. You may have heard me talking uh, just a bit in here saying find the information, get someone to show you the documentation. Developers don't like to create documentation. They also don't like to share the documentation. But if they have developed a database, a data structure, they've developed an application that uses that data, there is information about those data structures that they use that they can make available to you. So it's always a good idea to get with the development teams and find where the metadata is. Metadata is loosely defined as being information about data. 
it comes in many different formats. It can be a text document. It can be a data model. It can be some other type of JSON definition. But there is information out there. And I always recommend to people that engage the business owners of that data. Engage the developers and the technical sources that you have. Engage a DBA. Get what you can from them so you can see the different pieces of data. And that's always a place you want to go once you've identified what the data is that you need. Show you some examples of metadata that would be out there. Let's bring up access to show you a little bit about what's inside of your database. One of the queries I have here is actually shows me a list of tables. So this is actually going into the Access database itself, pulling out a list of the tables, their types that are there. So other things other than just simple tables will show up, but this is all the basic tables that are in there. You also have the ability to go into the database documenter here. Some of the app databases have one. I want to look at tables. Let's choose a table name or two. Go down into options. I want to see the names, data types, and sizes. Click OK and run this. And you can see that it gives me a little document here that I can then export that shows me the information associated with the tables that I've requested. So it'll show me the table names and the columns and the data types. Again, all the RDBMSs have some type of interface to allow you to see what's stored inside of it. You may not be able to execute it or to find it, but the DBA can. XML typically has associated with it an XSD, which is a definition of what's in there. Some of the XX, XSDs are a bit difficult to read, as well as sometimes the documentation is, but this is what an XX, XSD looks like. It tells you the different elements, the relationship between the elements as far as the nested structure is concerned, and the data types that are coming out of it. So you can see that we have inside of this uh, element called purchase order, and it has ship to and bill to of data types, which are addresses. We have name, street, city, which are strings for that address. So again, you can read through this and figure out how that works. Getting an example or getting someone to walk you through their data that they've used of XML will be good because they don't always create an XSD. When you're dealing with a EDI standard, you should be able to get access to one of the manuals or some other type of documentation for that E. DI, especially if you are actually reading it and someone is sharing it with you, means that they are bringing it in and or writing it, and so they have access to the manuals. This is an example of the manual that's out there. Yes, I know it's sort of hard to read at this level, but it will tell you what the different record types that are associated with it and the fields that are in those records, and it becomes very technical to try to read through this, but it is a source of metadata that you can use. And finally, within this looking at what's there, we can talk about data models. Being a data architect, data models are a very useful way to show for relational data. It shows you the tables, the entities, the relationships between them in a pictorial fashion. Anywhere you go, you should probably be able to get access to a data architect. Whether they share or don't share a model with you is a good place to start. But the nicest thing is it's a picture. You also can create your own metadata and your own pictures as you go through your development process. And we'll talk about that when we talk about target data. If you've been to my other videos, I've shared data models to you. There are a lot of modeling tools out there. Some of them are very expensive. This one happens to be a shareware on a web page. Uh, it's called SQL DBM. It's a nice way to do data models, but this is what a data model looks like. Essentially, it has a list of your tables. 
it has a picture of the tables and then it has a relationship showing you how to navigate between the relational data model that's out there in this case this is what's known as crow's feet i won't like get in detail into talking about data modeling but if you have lots of questions or some questions about data modeling go ahead and drop me a comment and subscribe to my channel and then we can go ahead and do some more work looking at just what data models tell you but essentially this is the table these are the columns there's a relationship from the breed dimension to the puppy fact table the relationship shows you the parent by this symbol and it shows you the child by the crow's feet symbol what this says is that for every breed record there might be multiple records in the fact table so parent child crow's feet connecting them between them shows you the the attributes the data types whether they're not foreign keys primary keys pk for primary key fk for car and key which means there's a relationship between these two and you can learn to navigate them as well everybody says well, i don't have access to a data modeler i have something a bit simpler that i use well you can generate your own data models through some of the query tools just by creating a relationship diagram associated with a specific query. And I discovered or have done this in the past for my access database. For example, this is the set of tables that we just saw from the Daisy Hill data warehouse. But I've created a query here called the Puppy Fact Data Model. And you can see that it basically bring this up what I did is I went into the design view dragged my tables in and actually drew in the relationship between the parent tables or dimensions and the child table or the fact table and so from that degree I have generated a very simplistic little data model it's not as sophisticated as from a modeling tool but at least lets me to pictorial see the data that I'm working with as I go through my development process So let's talk about how you get your data. Typically, it's a buyer beware kind of situation where the development team says, hey, I have this database, come get the data. Or they say, we have this FTP site and come get the data, pull it off of the FTP site and use it. I always try to avoid doing that as much as possible. I push back as the saying goes from, to the development team saying, hey, you know the data, I don't need, know the data. I would like for you to round up the data, process the data, document the data, and then send me the data, which is the data push, so that you don't have to understand all the ins and outs of the data. You don't have to worry about scheduling, whether the data is clean, whether the data is ready to go, what's the best time to pull it, has the data been properly updated before you pull it and then you don't have to worry about the connectivity and the issues uh, between the source of data and whatever tools you are using to process the data and so it's nice to have that discussion with the development team and with the business owners and the project owners to say hey you have the data can you put the data together for me can you document that data and then can you send it to me I like flat files so process that data, put it into flat files, send that flat file to me whenever during the nightly batch processing that you run, that data is available. So it puts the responsibility for the content of the data that you will be using onto the development team and the data owners of that data. So you don't have to wonder whether you're actually pulling that data properly, translating that data properly, or understanding the relationships of what's good data and bad data. So bit of a diatribe there going into it but I always like to push back and say yes I know where your data is but why do I have to go get it you can round it up and you can send it to me sometimes your data belongs to a third party and they will charge you to do such type of work sometimes they might actually have a tool that they allow you to define what data you need which again is not as easy as the data push but it's easier than you going directly into the database itself and pulling that data so again take a look at how that data can get put pushed to you rather than you having to pull it and then finally let's talk about development tools we've talked a lot about a lot about different data structures where your data may be in to begin with the great thing is that any of the modern day development languages even things like SQL 
can handle multiple data sources. So you don't rely upon writing your own to a degree, but some of those are. I have in the past built entire ETL structures in something such as C++, which is a programming language. Informatica is an expensive enterprise wide solution to ETL development or pooling data and manipulating data. If your company is using it, see if you can get a license to it. Java is a higher level language that's object oriented that is nice to use, easy to learn and can do a lot of work for you. It has a lot of plugins for different data types and data structures, so it's good. We cannot forget Altrix. Altrix is designed to handle any kind of data coming in. It has lots of plugins that allow you to easily read things just as, such as JSON or XML. Also to break down and translate some of the EDI structures is a, is a lot easier within Altrix than some of the other applications or your own language. SQL, believe it or not, can read source files. It can read other types of data. It can read portion and re-manipulate data to a degree to get into structures that you need and put into a database to give you access to. So do not discount SQL. And then there's IBM's ETL tool, which is data stage. Data stage is based primarily on SQL. So getting the most out of data stage means understanding SQL. So you sort of have a relationship going on there. But again, look at what tools your company might already have for you to use. If you've got Altrix, I think it's the best one for business analysts to be able to get to a wide variety of data sources. So I thank you for listening to me talk about data sources as far as data structures is concerned. I'm going to continue to do some videos about data structures and data modeling. So please subscribe to my channel. Check out all the videos I have about Altrix. I'm still crossing my fingers that maybe someday in the near future I'll get an Altrix license back again. But meanwhile, we can just talk about data since Altrix relies upon data and manipulates and creates data for you. Y'all have a great day.